Well, it's a party of two tonight, plus all of our friends hanging out in the chat on YouTube. It is Ivy Nation Sports Talk. We're up and rolling. It's Thursday. We've got plenty of things to talk about today. Jesse is back. He is decked out in uh, all of his Irish stuff. You feeling okay here this afternoon? Like Feeling uh, better. Your legs are there? Um, still a little like uh, I sat down at my computer to do a lot of you know research on this game and get stuff ready for the show and you know i was a little like you know light in the head here and there but it's all the uh antibiotics i believe so <laughs> just kind of hanging out this is the first work i've done of any kind this week so not too bad glad you're here and i'm sure everyone's glad you're here as well glad to have you and um did you see that uh chris tyree did you see that news today he has switched his number while in ireland he went from two to four. Did you see that by any chance today? I did not see that, but so here's what happened. News. Here's what happened. Chris Tyree had number two for the offense. DJ Brown, the safety, is number two for the defense. And Chris Tyree is the punt returner. DJ Brown is also on the punt return. Mm. Apparently, it took him getting to Ireland for them to realize that they had two number twos, which is Kind of a funny thing because just at practice last week when Chris Tyree was back there taking a return or two, I went, hmm, there's two number twos out there on that team. I wonder what they'll do about that. <laughs> you so, should have brought uh, it up then and there. I guess I should have. But uh, Chris Tyree has switched to number four. Do you remember what happened in the Pittsburgh game in 2012 when Notre Dame had uh, – Two guys out there wearing the same number. Does it, wasn't it on a field goal and then they missed it, it and was. Then they came they, back out yep. and made it because of it? Well, no, they weren't penalized. If the mm, flag had right. been thrown, they would have had the opportunity. They would have had a – it would have been a first down, actually. And so they might have even scored a touchdown out of it. But instead, they missed the field goal. Notre Dame ended up winning three overtimes later against Pittsburgh. And, of course, because of that, they ended up playing in the BCS right, championship right, game. Right that season but good thing they caught it so chris tyree went from 25 last year to number two during the spring and in training camp and now he will be number four when we see him on saturday so there it is and brian is right notre dame did win that game in the third overtime on a field goal so but anyway they won't have to worry about that at least with those two some uh, some hilarity. We were just talking before we started the show. The Dan Patrick show has been over there doing the radio show all week. Will Farrell, noted USC fan, has been hanging out with him. And the the hilarious uh, video from from the interview with Brady Quinn. I guess it was yesterday. I don't know if it because of the time difference. I don't know exactly when it took place. But Brady Quinn was on there, and uh, Brady was telling a story about how when uh, the Irish were playing at USC one year. Will Ferrell was on the sideline, and apparently Will Ferrell was going, "Hey, number ten, your pants are too high." <laughs> that was his, that was his heckle, and he had Brady Con uh, Brady Quinn uh, self conscious about his pants for a while after that. So I thought it was funny, uh, and Will Ferrell, you know, Dan Patrick asked, is, "Is that the kind of heckler that you are?" And he said, "Yeah, I'm. I, I'm not the aggressive heckler, you know. I'm. I'm the guy of, hey, right. you run a little awkward, right." <laughs> your arms flail about as if they have no purpose like i actually appreciate that it's a little bit more imaginative than just you know random fans throwing f-bombs at guys yeah. out there exactly so, i mean i think throwing f-bombs is kind of lazy anyone can go out there and yeah you know, f this and f that exactly exactly and he's will ferrell so it's you know it's like people were going to recognize him so <laughs> he uh he inserted a little jocularity in there good stuff well glad to have you with us here today, we've got uh, our, this will be the last regular show for us this week. We will be hitting record 
on countdown to kickoff tomorrow and then tomorrow night at some point the video will be up and the regular podcast will drop saturday morning that's kind of how countdown to kickoff is going to work this year there will not be a live show saturday morning anymore you'll be able to access the video friday night and uh, the audio podcast including a rapid fire which will have a rapid fire here today and i see derek is is in the house but uh, Derek was very upset that I wouldn't ask myself questions in a rap <laughs> during the solo show last night. Fortunately, I have Jesse, so I'll lob him the questions tonight. We will have a rapid fire tonight. Jesse, do you have your whiteboard fired up and ready to go tonight? Yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of a lot of tabs when you when you start talking about um, playing an offense like Navy and throwing in the fact that there's kind of an added wrinkle this year with the new offensive coordinator yes. and kind of the play distribution that you couldn't expect. So um, did a lot of homework on Kennesaw state offense last year. Ooh. All right. All right. Well, we'll see where that goes. And of course you had to do your Kennesaw state homework because Grant Chestnut, who was the new offensive coordinator at Navy or not. At, yeah. At Navy. He was at Kennesaw State last year, and he even goes back to, he originally worked, I believe, as the quarterback's coach for Paul Johnson. Paul Johnson, of course, who was the, the uh, predecessor to Ken Niamatalola, who went from Navy to Georgia Tech. Uh, Grant Chestnut followed him to Georgia Tech. So you know, Georgia Tech continued offense, of course, when Paul Johnson was from there to Kennesaw State, where he's been for the last several years. And so... He has run a triple option offense that has more passing elements to it than what Navy has had in recent years. How much more? Well, here's the comparison. The Owls ranked 10th in the FCS. They are an FCS, not FBS level team, but they ran for over 232 yards a game last year. Also passed for nearly 137 yards a game. You compare that to Navy, which averaged 241 yards a uh, rushing per game, but just 85.7 passing yards per game. So Grant Chestnut's offense averaged about 50 more passing yards per game. So that there's a little bit more balance in there. So we're going to talk about like how big a factor you think this is. And, and just uh, whenever you're ready, you can break out your old uh, trusty whiteboard and go to town on this. What, what all this means for uh, the triple option offense from and for Notre Dame's defense. Yeah, so this is today's a little tough because um, I've been, like I said, I've been kind of sick this week, so I wasn't able to get my full computer set up back and running. So I'm kind of off one computer. Uh oh. Like, I got kind of. <laughs> I have notes that I've typed out, so I hope that those. I don't want to leak my notes before we we'll get into this, but if that's what happens, that is what happens. But I think. What I would talk about first in terms of Navy's or, – or sorry, the the added kind of passing attack that you might see out of Navy this year is in watching Kennesaw State last year. I mean, they're still a predominant option team first. And I think they really – and I don't want to say they only get into passing when it's like absolutely necessary, you know, like second and ten – kind of third and 10, but that's going to be more of where you see Kennesaw State kind of lining up to run pass plays. Um, and, and I think that happens when, you know, the whole point in an option is you're kind of hoping to average three yards a play, right? And and really get to maybe a fourth and one or hope to get four yards on one of those plays and go, you know, three, three, four, whatever the combination might be. But if you disrupt them early, that puts them in second and long, third and long, and that is going to be when you see Navy get more uh, off schedule. They're not going to be, you know, uh, a lot of times you see the Navy offense, even in second and 10, third and 10, knowing that the option is, again, a, a three to four yard average kind of play, they will abandon it and get try to get yards back quickly with the passing game, right? And instead of kind of being stubborn of what we've seen in the past of even if you, they get blown up, they're still, you know, running that, that option, uh, lining up and running it, you know, 95% of the time. Let me ask you as a, as a guy 
again, who played middle linebacker your whole life. You played against a triple option offense, Mishawaka High School, when you were at, at, at Adams here in South Bend, played against it all four years. They didn't necessarily – like their idea of pass was, you know, like element of surprise – Right. Basically, but it was there was no real read. It was chuck it downfield. So what do you see in terms of the read and what extra pressure does that put on you as the defender making your read? Does it kind of put you on the heels a little bit, just kind of knowing that that they could, you know, that there is at least a threat of a pass there that typically is not there with a triple option? You know, I'm going to be kind of blunt about this. Um, If I'm Notre Dame on defense. I'm not overly worried about Navy's passing game. Okay. Um, I think you are reading, you know, triple option first. And if you, in your read, you notice, you know, that it's going to be pass, then it's just your normal diagnosis of, you know, run pass and then diagnosing pass play if as a linebacker and a member of the secondary. Right. And so it's, I would, again, Notre Dame has gone against much more legit passing attacks than what they're going to face against Navy. And so as a player, I would be geared up more to to the triple option responsibilities every play and knowing what that can do to me rather than, you know, a very average passing game that will come after it. Notre Dame's athleticism and speed is enough to make up for the element of surprise. Yeah. In the passing attack. And so that's why I don't think it's, again, overly a concern. Yeah, you got to know, you know, what routes and and, and stuff is going to come out of the passing play so you can get into the proper, you know, coverage. But again, as a linebacker, I would be more geared up towards making sure I'm, I, I know where I'm going every play in terms of the option. And then if I see pass, then I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, self-diagnose from there almost. Well, and you you kind of add into that that you have two quarterbacks of different skills. Gleaton coming out of the spring, the guy who was the most proficient passer, we're told, by Bill Wagner, the Navy insider. He was the best passer of all the quarterbacks on the roster, but uh, he is academically, you know, was academically ineligible coming out of the uh, the spring because he had to go to summer school, couldn't go to practices, all this different stuff. So, he had a lot of ground to make up in the on the academic side, but you've got Ty Lavatai, last year's predominant starter before he got injured, and sophomore Blake Horvath, who hasn't played a snap yet. Lavatai only completed forty six percent of his passes. Horvath, the better passer between the two, we're going to see both of them this weekend. It sounds like you know if if Navy sticks to what they've said they're going to do anyway. D- does it really again? D- d- does it really affect Notre Dame? that much the fact no, that and I using think two that, different guys I think the only thing that it affects is there's going to be a tendency of what one guy has better skills at and once that's kind of diagnosed um there's just certain things you might you know look out for like if one guy's a better passer and all of a sudden he's kind of coming in and it's maybe a second and eight second and nine you know a little bit longer than than you are anticipating Maybe, you know, uh, at a higher probability that a pass play is coming, right? I just think when, you, when you're when you rotating different quarterbacks out, it's still the base offense. It's just one guy one guy compared to the other can do things a little bit better. And I think that's the only thing you have to worry about defensively is maybe one quarterback is faster on the perimeter. So, you you know, as a perimeter defender, you know, okay, I, I should be conscious of this. Or, again, maybe a guy is a little bit better of a passer and it's a passing down situation. Well, then as a secondary guy, you're like, okay, well, I should probably, you know, now that this quarterback is in, be locked in maybe on my keys a little bit better here. I just think that when you introduce a different quarterback, there's a reason why they're on the field. And so you kind of have to kind of, you know, decode what they're trying to accomplish in that situation because you don't just switch out quarterbacks for no reason. One of the keys for cornerbacks anyway against this offense is you can obviously get lulled to sleep out there because it's typically – the wide receivers are just out there stock blocking unless they actually do run a route. But as a corner, you can't get caught peeking in the backfield. When they do, that's when you get the ball thrown over your head. So they just essentially have to continue to carry out their assignment, defending if if it's if it's one on one with Navy receivers, Notre Dame's corners should win that matchup every time. They just have to make sure that they're locked into that, you know. Right. 
Um, so yeah, again, I, I think that the biggest concern uh, when you play Navy is always going to be the triple option and how you have to defend the triple option. So I think that could kind of segue. Um, Hang on. Tommy Gunn said he thinks he missed an inside joke and he's stuck on the outside. I'm not sure what that's in reference to because then he, then he asked if I shadow banned him. So I don't know if I missed an earlier comment where, where something was said or what, but I'm not exactly sure what any of that is in reference to. So I think um, sometimes we get caught, they, we get caught in, trying to figure out what what kind of outside conversations that I just got <laughs> get caught peeking in the backfield there <laughs> yeah, when, when I was looking at the chat. I think, and Tommy Guns. I think that's what was going on a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, you've been teasing everybody. You've been holding out. Whiteboard has been promised. Do you have triple option whiteboard ready to go? Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out <laughs> what screen it's on, to be honest with you. Um, but I think that this is, there we go. Okay. Here we go. Let me, let me punch this up and we're ready. So, I mean, you could see, I have a lot of tabs up here. So there's kind of a lot of a different looks to get into, but this is, uh, first and foremost, this is kind of the base of what you'll see Kennesaw State run out of. There'll be different variations. Standard wing T with a receiver on each side. Yeah, basically. so you got basically center of the field, uh, wide receiver split out on each side, um, two uh, you know guard guard and tackle on each side, uh, fullback behind the quarterback who's under center, and then like you said, the the wing T. So you have two wings, um, no one on each side of the tackle. This is Kennesaw State's base formation. Um, they do. Uh, you know, various different things out of this. Um, for example, you know, I've seen them where they bring these both wide receivers in. And so they'll put all 11 players in the box um, at some I've seen, point. I've seen Mishawaka do that quite a bit over the years. Right. Um, you'll see sometimes they'll bring one of these guys in and leave a wide receiver kind of flanked out to the side. So you got mm -hmm. 10 guys in the box. There's Again, it, it, there's a lot of variation, but the base of this, the root of this, is they're going to be in some sort of, you know, wing T quarterback under center, fullback um, behind the quarterback with his hand in the dirt. Yep. So when you're looking at this, I think it's important to kind of get into the simple, you know, the slim, the simplicities of what is going to happen in the triple option. And I've aligned this defense. This is how Notre Dame played this wing T Um last year they put basically eight guys in the box four down linemen um you got two your your two you know your 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 viper um and your defensive end those guys are going to stay on the outside shoulder of the the wing t backs or the up backs um then you're going to have a linebacker on the outside of, of both of those defensive ends or viper um and, and then you're going to have two linebackers kind of in the middle and they were having it last year um where the 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 nose tackle um, and the three technique for Notre Dame were, were kind of head up of the guard and the inside linebackers were just kind of playing on the outside um, of the interior defensive linemen. And then they had, you know, obviously you can't leave wide receivers on the perimeter uncovered. So you have a corner kind of matching each wide receiver split out and then they just drop their safety kind of right over the center, you know, three, four yards um, behind the linebackers. So this is, I imagine this is what they're going to do again this year, right? Like I think Al Golden's not going to come out with a completely different game plan for the triple option. I think that he's going to look back on last year's film and tweak some things, but I, I, I still expect this to be kind of their base defense when, when Navy comes out in this wing T look. Okay. So you don't, you don't think they'd, they'd go with, with like five, defensive linemen. You think they're, they're pretty set with the four, what they showed last year. Yeah. And again, it's hard to go five because now you're you're kind of taking away from your edge linebackers, right? And, and if the quarterback and the pitch man get to the alley on the outside, that really puts your linebacker kind of in a in a tough position with you know only three linebackers, right? So I, I expect them to kind of stay in this a four four kind of bear almost look, right? Like. That's that's ultimately what it reminds me of. Okay, so let me ask you. I'm going to ask you a couple questions about 
some keys and responsibilities here. Let's look at the two defensive tackle positions, the two interior guys, because what do we know about the triple option offense? It is, it is geared around the quarterback and the fullback. Basically the, the, the ball is obviously always in the quarterback's hands. He puts the ball in the, in the belly of the fullback. What, what do those two interior defensive linemen want to do in terms of, you know, how they're going to try to take away the fullback, whether it's the dive or the outside veer. What are those guys? What are those guys doing inside and on the other side of it? What is the quarterback reading when he makes his first decision? Yeah, so that's a good question because the quarter there's there's two there's two schemes um, for a triple option offense. You're either reading like you were talking about these interior defensive linemen. Um, or if you're more of a, a kind of a veer triple option, you're going to read the defensive ends like you were talking about. I suspect, and we'll get into this kind of here in a little bit, I suspect that based off of what I've seen from Kennesaw State, that the interior defensive linemen are going to be the, the read players. The main keys. Okay. For, for this triple option attack. Um, now, that doesn't mean that, that these defensive ends won't be, but I I would say majority of the plays, the interior defensive linemen are going to be sort of your, your read, your read players um, in this offense. So when those guys are your read players uh, for me, and and I think what you'll see out of Notre Dame is both of these guys are essentially just going to pinch the a gaps immediately. Right. So if any dive is coming, you know, this way, or this way, that's where you know defensive these, tackle. You, in theory, is supposed to be there to uh, to cause some uh, cause some some turbulence at the line of scrimmage, right? To to essentially you know clog the play up, right? Like obviously right. he's got a let that, that they've got guards over him as well, but they're going to be taught to you know basically engage half the body of this guard um, and, and keep this you know inside arm free for the fullback. You know, that's they're going to have inside arm is free for the fullback. And again, the the outside arm is going to be used to to engage these guards because, I mean, there's no way around it. These guards are going to engage them immediately. They just have to be able to keep, you know, an arm free to latch onto that fullback uh, once he's in the hole immediately, essentially. Um, And so when you're reading interior defensive linemen or, you know, out of the the defensive end, the reads are still. Um, ultimately the same. So let me get rid of a little bit of line work here to, to clear it up. I've become really proficient today in using this software. Not that I wasn't before, but today was the day I got extra good at this. Um, right. So it, it, again, the, the premise of the triple option is you're reading some sort of dive man because the fullback is that's, that's an option every single time, right? It, it's the ball is in the belly of the fullback. Um, and whether they give it or not is going to be predicated off of uh, the defensive end and defensive tackle. If the defensive tackle steps down, um, that is an immediate, you know, the, the quarterback is pulling it. But when this defensive tackle or defensive end, depending on who the read man is, gets wide, I would again, the terminology is wide. That means that, that the give is, is going to go, you know, right now. And, and if that's, if they're reading that guy and the defensive tackle gets wide, they're going to let the fullback take it um, and, and just run with it. But maybe they're running the outside veer and maybe the defensive end gets wide. Well, then that means that there's a, some sort of crease here. So they're going to allow the fullback to, to take the ball. But if, if they step down or crash down, it's going to be a fake to the fullback. And now option one is gone and it's between, you know, quarterback and pitch man at that point. What do you think about this comment? Michael Park says four four three blitz blitz blitz. I I I've I've heard people you know say the answer when you're playing this offense is blitz. What's what's the benefit? Um, what's, what's the biggest downside of blitzing? So the 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 biggest benefit of blitzing is you get on them now, right? You force their hand, um, and you make them make decisions quickly. And that can, you know, lead to blown up plays, fumbles, you know, whatever it might be. 
But the downside to that is in an offense like this where it's so systematic and there's, again, three kind of options. If you if you make a blunder or, or one misstep, that's what this offense kind of thrives off of, right? Then you're talking about a 50-yard run probably. Right. And so say you – maybe the, the, the linebacker blitzes the wrong gap. Um, the defensive tackle can't get off his block and they give it to the, the fullback right up the A gap. You know, again, maybe this linebacker is kind of blitzing over here. This this defensive tackle can't get off his block. Well, I mean, who's who's left there to, you know, to tackle the fullback when he's got already three or four yards downfield, right? It's going to be the backside linebacker trying to work over top. And of course, maybe the safety coming downhill. But again, it's your running risk of blitzing players and getting out of kind of uh, out of alignment defensively and creating a lane for the offense in the triple option. Yeah, I agree with what Stymie said. Let's see if they can tackle first. Let's see how sound tacklers they are before <laughs> we start thinking about blitzing in this game. <laughs> it's a very good point. All right, now let's say uh, let's say the quarterback decides, okay, the dive's not there. So now he's going to roll either left or right. And, of course, he's got his two uh, wing backs, you know, split backs, whatever you want to call them. Some offenses just call it their, their halfback. They're the, the more athletic guys who are on the wings up, you know, off the line of scrimmage. Let's, let's say he's going to roll to the left now. So we've got a roll to the left by the quarterback. Who's reading what for Notre Dame's defense? What are the assignments that have to be carried out by Notre Dame's defense? Yeah. So this is kind of a tricky question on your part. Because, you know, I'm just going to flat out kind of say this now. Kennesaw State last year, they they wanted to fold their quarterback into kind of the, the line of scrimmage more than anything else. Not to say that, that they wouldn't attack you on the perimeter, but their quarterback wanted to take the ball and kind of run between the tackles. So they did like some inside you. curl type stuff. Yeah. yeah. And so, so say, so say, uh, or quarterback is, follow, like where he's following the fullback up the gut. Well, not so it's even kind of, uh, a little even crazier than that. Right. So, uh, what you'll see is sometimes one of these T backs will go in kind of like a, a pre-snap motion and it almost kind of on the snap of the ball, it almost looks like, you know, a, a wing T kind of eye formation. Um, and so on the snap of the ball, Sorry, let me let me backtrack a little bit. That's a different um, different play. But uh, again, the, uh, the wing T will on the on the snap of the ball, quarterback will fake the dive uh, to the fullback. This wing T back from the uh, the opposite side. So if the play's going left, the wing the right T back hand, from right. the from the yeah. right will kind of sneak in behind the fullback and also be a lead blocker. So essentially in this, in this play that they like to run a lot, the fullback will take the fake dive into the a gap. He'll clog the a gap. This wing T will kind of follow and replace. He'll lead into the B gap quarterback will fake this to the fullback, allow the wing T to kind of clear. And then he's following a convoy of his wing T back and his fullback kind of lead blocking into the, you know, a B gap. But again, this right. is, why I was bringing this up because Kennesaw State's quarterback last year loved this play. He loved to fake and fold into the the line of scrimmage behind the tackles and allow his fullback and his wing tee back to be lead blockers um, through the hole. And so you asked earlier, you know, what what is the importance of noticing different quarterbacks on the field? I think this is one of those situations where I think there's going to be a quarterback that's more kind of prone to these between the tackle type runs between the two quarterbacks. You're saying one is probably more likely to do this than the other. Correct. And I think that's going to be one of the bigger things to look for, because again, this was, this was like <laughs> Kennesaw state. This was like their favorite, you know, they there's window dressing of again, different formations and putting different guys in for, you know, sure. motion and, and whatever. But this is at the end of the day, what they were getting into majority of the time is fake dive to the fullback. Um, and then some sort of, you know, where the quarterback is folding in and following these blockers and kind of knifing his way uh, through the defense a little bit. Interesting. All right. And I think that's, what's going to, so 
and that's why I was talking about that's the reason why majority of, of the of the run plays are going to be reading these interior defensive linemen because the quarterback also it wants to run between the tackles, right? Right. And so if both plays, the, if the quarterback and the fullback are reading, you know, are, are, are going to be running between the tackles, then there's no reason to be reading these outside defensive ends, essentially. Well, and it, so if the if the defensive tackles are pinching in and taking away the A gaps, then obviously you've got a linebacker and a defensive end out there. What's what, what's the most important thing that they have to quickly recognize so that that doesn't turn into, you know, a minimum five yard play downfield? Yeah. So. And all of these schemes and anytime you see, you know, offenses that use these wing T backs, you know, H backs, up backs, whatever you want to call it. Those these this is the most important kind of read for, you know, linebackers. I would say that, you know, that so they I, have to recognize what that what that wing is doing that you're talking about, who could potentially turn into a lead blocker. They have to recognize that as soon as possible. Right. So if the if that wing T is kind of coming more underneath, then you probably recognize that he's trying to find, you know, a lead blocking type alley play. But if he comes, you know, gets more depth and, and gets deeper behind the quarterback, that's when you're going to see more of the true triple option of this is a fake. And then the quarterback and the wing T are getting in good phase trying to get, you know, to the outside. Out but the alley. Yeah. As a linebacker, you got to be able this this up back or H back is going to take you to the play majority of the time, because after the fullback dive again, if he's leading through the hole, well, <laughs> quarterback's got to be following in some capacity. Right. And so that means that that play is going to be inside, but if he's not going through the hole, he's probably trying to get good again, phase on the outside. Good, good, you know, good depth. Good, yeah. Good depth, good phase in, in terms of relationship with the quarterback. And then, you know, it's a play kind of more outside on the perimeter here. So, as a linebacker, the outside, or the inside linebackers are are mainly keying in on this fullback. Outside linebackers, you know, they have to determine what these wing T backs are doing because everything's going to get clogged up here in the middle, and they're going to have to kind of step down into these lanes as kind of cleanup players. Interesting. So, uh, you know, a lot of times we see one of the safeties, or, or you know, even multiple safeties out there as those outside linebackers when Notre Dame lines up against the triple option. Is that what you're thinking? Like, like we see, yeah, it's got to be a guy that's, that's got to be, he's got, they got to be physical. Got a little bit more quicks and physicality to him. It's definitely got to be physicality. Um, and I get, yeah, like Jalen Snead is someone who, who, who like raises a brow in these kind of games because of, is just he's got good size and good speed at the linebacker position, and that's what um, I was going to ask you, like where where you would potentially position Snead in all this. I would see Osbury being another person like that. Okay. Um, I think you'll see some action from him this weekend, just for that reason. I think he's got enough athleticism um, and size that he can hold his own, depending on if he needs to, you know, come down into the box uh, and and bring the physicality of again tackling, you know, a quarterback or a. Um, a fullback kind of coming, you know, full speed at you. Um, and, and then maybe you diagnose the plays on the perimeter, then that's where you got to have the speed to kind of, you know, stay in, stay in line uh, with the quarterback and the pitch man. All right. So that's interesting. Basically what you're saying is when uh, one of those wings goes in motion, he's most likely going to take you where the ball is going, depending yeah, on that's, the, that's if exactly, goes shallow I would say, or goes deep. If you're gonna if you're gonna key into something, you know, to to really try to determine what Navy's gonna accomplish in terms of the run game, if that wing if that wing T back, you know, depending on if the play's going left or right, so depending on you know if the, if it's the left or right uh, T back, um, if they if they get if they stay you know nice and shallow um, and underneath, I would say then you can expect kind of an inside sort of triple option run play again if they get depth. And get behind, you know, the, the running back and the quarterback, um, you know, four or five yards. I would expect some sort of fullback dive and a true kind of triple option heading towards the perimeter. Okay. All right. Anything else you want to address for Notre Dame's defense or you want to flip it over and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the other side of the ball? Um. So, yeah, there were a couple, um, couple plays – like there was, there were looks, passing looks that I wanted to get into. 
um, that Notre Dame can kind of expect that they probably haven't seen too much before okay. kind of out of Navy. And I'll, I'll try to be a little bit quicker um, with these ones, but let me see here. So this would be – this is kind of like a, a, a one – a one, you know, a, a one wing tee look. I don't know how else to describe this. Oh, just um, a one wing look. Yeah. Yeah. So you got a quarterback under center, fullback behind them. Um, you got uh, kind of trips left. Um, and part of that trips, the three wide receiver is the wing tee back. Um, and then you got a two wide receiver, a one wide receiver. And then the opposite side of the field, um, you had just a single wide receiver. But they ran this concept last year multiple times. It's just basically streaks down the field, um, but it's out of this. Again, it looks – you, you kind of come out and it looks like they might be running some sort of option play, um, but they can quite quite easily uh, uh, release into these kind of, you know, passing routes, I guess you would say. And I'd say the most interesting part about this is the wing tee back likes to fold in between the guard and left tackle to make it kind of look like – He's lead blocking, but then he'll just try to release downfield and get into um, some sort of passing route. So just something to kind of look look at, I guess I would say. Okay. Um, let me see. I got a couple more here. Uh, this is ah. – so then this is, you know, sometimes <laughs> – and I don't think we're used to maybe seeing Navy do this, but there were times last year where Kennesaw State literally just came out and kind of set up in your normal, you know, shotgun spread, spread it out. type of pass plays, right? So you got quarterback and shotgun, uh, wide receivers split out to the right, and then you got a two-by-two two formation. So you got two wide receivers on each side, and they just, you know, kind whatever their route concepts are, they'll line up and, and try to run, you know, some plays out of these. So – um, and I've also seen them where they've lined up in shotgun and, you know, run trips into the into the boundary. That was another thing that I saw. So I guess what I'm saying is you can expect them to, in some capacity, uh, come out in some, I guess, traditional kind of passing looks, right? Um, and so don't be caught off guard when you see some of that. And then I would say I got one last one. I thought this was kind of nifty. Um, again, this is... This is where this and this and this formation really intrigues me because you're putting all 11 players um, into the box. So it's like, I, I don't know, there's just no separation and no spacing at all. I don't I don't personally it's aesthetically not pleasing, um, <laughs> but they'll run out of it. Right. So you'll have your typical wing T formation. And so instead of, you know, having both wide receivers split out wide, you bring them into the into the into the box. And I think this is a formation where you you just you have to trust your eyes more than anything because when you see this formation, it screams inside run, right? Like you're not thinking pass at all in this situation. Um, but this is a, a, a nice concept that they kind of ran out of this formation where these two, uh, you know, a guy on each side is kind of running wheel routes out to the sidelines. And then the two inside guys are kind of running, you know, different – I would say, you know, flood routes at different depths, like a five yard flood and a 10 yard flood um, over the middle. So it's a nice concept. And again, when you're running the triple option the whole game and you bring everything in tight like this, you're expecting run. But you just kind of have to trust your keys and your reads and be able to get into pass if that's what you diagnose. All right. Um, and then I think that kind of covers it all. But I will say. Um, getting into my to my notes here a little bit. Again, their quarterback loves to keep the ball and 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 run between the tackles. I think that's what you're going to see majority of um, against Navy this weekend is the quarterback loves to keep the ball and run between the tackles. Um, they will bring in the wide receivers at times. Again, that super kind of tight formula or not formula formation um, that I was just showing. And then it, what they'll do when they're in that wing T look is they'll space out those wide receivers on each side and they'll put them all the way out to the numbers. And the reason why you want to do that is it, again, it, it creates like an alley, right? So the farther you space out those wide receivers, you're pushing those defensive backs out 
and you're creating a bigger gap be between the end man on the line of scrimmage sure. and your defensive back. So you'll really see those wide receivers spaced out to create, you know, valleys or lanes for them, I guess you would say. But yep. again, in this offense, it all comes down to the fullback dive. The fullback dive has to be taken care of first and foremost. Um, and if you get lazy, that's the play that's going to gouge you for 40 or 50 yards when you fall asleep. So you have to stay true to the fullback dive. That's the most important part of the triple option. you got to stop that fullback dive first. All right. Do you want to save the defense for tomorrow for the countdown show? I think so. And I, cause I, I also wasn't quite able to get as much out of that <laughs> as okay. I want. I needed to spend a little bit more time on that one. Okay. All right. Let's do that. I had a feeling as much as you had there, uh, you know, for Notre Dame's defense and, and Navy's triple option offense. I had a feeling that that's kind of the I way. hope I just realized it's already 640. So I hope I didn't lull people asleep um, <laughs> with that. But if you watch this show and, hey. you watch what, and you watch the game on Saturday, I promise you that you'll, you'll see at one that. point and you'll say, huh, I know a guy who went through this not two days ago. And I'm, I'm not surprised by the quarterback taking the, the ball between the tackles this often. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because we we really we haven't seen as much of that, you know, from uh, from Navy's offense in recent years. Really, you know, even you know, a, a few years ago, do you, did you did you watch when they did that? Remember they did the season with Notre Dame football. Then I think it was the next year they did it with Navy football, and they had the bigger, you know, kind of a you know, like more Tim Tebow looking uh, quarterback back there. He ran. Yeah quite a bit you know like a, a <laughs> it's little funny bit more you physical. bring that up i was uh watching a lot of the so a classic debate i think in college football is teams like navy blatantly run the triple option but there's so many teams who run the triple option but it just doesn't look like the standard triple option and yeah when tim tebow was at florida that was a prime case of it tim tebow they ran a ton of triple option plays, it was just triple option out of shotgun. It was just spread. Yeah, spread option stuff. Yeah. And so, like, that's why. So, I think people often get kind of, you know, not confused, but when, again, when you think of triple option, I think people think of the traditional wing T, mm -hmm. fullback in the hand in the dirt, fullback dive immediately. But there's so many variations to the triple option these days that you can still run it out of the spread and everything. So, just a, just a quick thought while we are on, you know, triple option week. Good stuff. Good stuff. I mean, fortunate for us, we only have to see it once, just like Notre Dame. Yeah, and I'm I'm <laughs> actually kind of glad that they're doing it first game of the year. I think it gets it out of the way. Um, and and not having to play Navy late in the season when guys are already kind of battling, you know, some sort of bumps and bruises. It's nice to get this game, you know, out of the way, I, I would say. And, and guys are fresh. Um, they're not already having pre-existing injuries, so – I really like that this game is, is first overall. Great stuff. And Great last stuff. time they played in Ireland, first game of the year, their name thumped them 50 to 10. 50 to 10. That is exactly right. That is your first whiteboard of the season. I hope you're happy. People have been clamoring for the whiteboard. The whiteboard is back, and it will be here every Thursday throughout the season. Good stuff, Jess. There's, Are you ready uh, for rapid fire? I am ready for rapid fire, but this this Wendy's breakfast <laughs> in the chat right now. I know. See, like this tells you where everyone's <laughs> minds went, you know, during right. some of that. But so. I, I just think it's funny because when I left the emergency room a couple of days ago, I was starving and they kept pumping me with medicine. So my stomach was just like, <laughs> you know, just like, you know, when like you get a lot of medicine, on, you take a lot of medicine on empty stomach, you just kind of feel the gurgles. Well, I hadn't had anything for breakfast, so I stopped at Wendy's actually and got uh, got some Wendy's breakfast. So mm. they made me think of that when they when they started. Was it good? I don't think I've ever had Wendy's breakfast before. It's uh, it got the job done. You know, what yeah. I mean? I'm, I'm a classic McDonald's guy. Give me a good sausage McGriddle or you know whatever it might sausage be. Sausage biscuit. Yeah, yeah sausage biscuit. But it got the job done. Can't complain. Yeah. All right. Let's get a Notre Dame football question. Fill in the blank. It's blank that Marcus Freeman said today that center Zeke Carell practiced all week and he's going to play Saturday. He's going to start against Navy. It's fantastic news. You know, when we talked about this kind of a week and a half ago and we were kind of given our, I would say, overreaction Tuesday of, you know, Zeke Carell not playing and the possible implications, you know, 
the 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 center is like the linebacker of the offense. He's got to be able to set the the runner pass, you know, protection. Uh, be able to call out blitzes. Um, be able to you know work with his off- fellow offensive linemen in a weave, you know, nice flow type of system where they're just picking up and calling out blitzes. And I, I think all of that starts um, with your center. And so when you have your starting center in there, you have your starting quarterback in there, everyone's on the same page. Everyone's, you know, being able to recognize and call out the plays um, that are required. And I, I just think in, in, a, in, a, in a game where assignments are really, really important, that's, you know, when you play the Naval Academy or any of the academies, you have to play really assignment sound football. Um, and, and you want your starting center in there for that reason, because he's going to get you to your assignment. That's absolutely right. And to have him in the middle with two go with both guards who are going to be making their first starts. I just think that it is huge. So now you've got the guy making the calls in the middle of the line with all of the experience that he has. And you've got the tackles on the outside with all the experience that, that they have that. So that's, that's just that much more kind of safety net for those two guards making their way through their first career start out there against what is not necessarily a complex defense, but it, it is a defense that is going to play you physical. They're going to be tenacious. They're going to keep coming at you. They're going to do at least some unusual things. So I think that it's just – it's so vital that Notre Dame ha- is going to be able to have Zeke Carell out there. On yeah. Saturday. And like you said, when you got and another important aspect is when you have two first time starters at the guard position, uh, they need to be able to rely on the center. Right. Like that's that's their guy. Um, and he provides that experience. And I think he provides some of that comforting feeling again for first time starters. And again, I mean, they're, they're on a big stage. Right. Like even though the opponent, what you could say what you want of the opponent. They're still playing in Ireland. It's still a big deal. A lot of people are going to be there. It's the probably the most you know, impactful, important game of the week zero games. Like it, there's, there's still a lot riding on this game, you know? And so having a guy like Zeke Carell there to kind of maybe calm some of those nerves um, is very important. Here's what I want to know. Trader Z, I pray no serious injuries. I think everyone's in on that for Notre Dame and both Angeli and Minchie get to play. So are we going to be on Angeli Minchie watch every week? Like, is that how this whole season's <laughs> going to go? When you get, when you have some, a situation yet. like last year, there's just lingering PTSD that carries uh-huh. over into the next season. Yeah, exactly. So, and I mean, you know, it, it is Navy. I don't know that they're necessarily going to go out there and keep slinging the ball around. If it gets to the point where Angeli and or Minchie get out there, I would doubt very, very, much that Kenny Minchie sees the field in this game. Yeah, it's going to be the Hartman and Angeli show. And like I told you, and we'll get into, oh man, I hope everyone joins our show tomorrow because I, I'll have a whole betting segment of my own. But <laughs> I, I just, they're going to let Sam Hartman light it up, man. Then I think you're going to see kind of so Angeli too. take it, take it into the, take it into the how or, you know, into the shed or however you want to say it. You know what I mean? They'll, they'll really build, build it up. Let Sam Hartman cook, let him get comfortable and then let Steve Angeli kind of ride off into the sunset with the rest of the game, I think, is what you'll see. You'll hit him, hit that D cell, you know, when Steve Angeli kind of comes in there towards the end. By the way, while Zeke Carell will play this week, Eli Raritan will not. We had a question about Eli Raritan earlier uh, this week, and Marcus Freeman said today that Raritan's target date to return is the North Carolina State game, week three, <laughs> September 9th. So, uh, no Eli Raritan, and I think that's a good thing. They've got Holden Stays. They've got Mitchell Evans. They've got Davis Sherwood as the number three guy right now. I don't think that there is any reason to try to push Eli Raritan back one minute, one game, one week, one day too soon after he's had ACL tears of the same knee two years in a row. Yeah, and they have plenty of depth at the tight end position. There's bodies there, um, and it's not <laughs> It's not really uh, – uh, you know, there's <laughs> there's not a lot of separation between that tight end room, right? And so if you have a lot of bodies and there's not a lot of separation between, you know, the bodies that are in there, there's no reason to push a guy, um, especially with those prior kind of injuries to in a, in a, in a physical type game for, for no reason almost. Yeah. How will you define a successful season for Notre Dame football this year? Is it, and this is basically your minimal expectation, like, 
minimally, how will you define a successful season for Notre Dame? Yeah, um, I I define a successful season for Notre Dame of one doing better than last year. Um, what that means is they were eight and four last year. I would like them at very worst, and I'm not I'm not saying this is what is what I would determine to be successful, but you at least have to go nine and three in my opinion. Um, a successful season is ten wins. Um, And whatever bowl appearance kind of comes off of that. And I think if you get 10 wins, you're probably looking at some sort of New Year's six type bowl game. So I will say personally for me, getting better and and getting to a 10 win kind of crest and and being in some sort of um, uh, New Year's six type game. And that's that's the basement for me. The ceiling is, of course, I have I still have the expectation that they're contending for a national championship as 11 and one team you know, and, and a perfect world, a 12 and 0 team. Yeah. The ceiling is a playoff, I think, but I think my minimal expectation is not just get to a new year's six bowl, but win a new year's six bowl. It's, it's time. Yeah. I'd like to add that amendment to mine too, because they've had plenty of appearances in the last two decades, but they haven't won any of those new year's six games. So I would say 10 wins and the 11th win being in the new year's six game. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I'm looking at. 10 and two season and get to or or not get to but win a new year's six bowl because that means you're going to be playing another quality opponent they had that opportunity a couple of years ago they got to the bowl but again they weren't able to win it because they weren't able to hold on in the second half so yeah and it's interesting I'm to get uh, over the hump. you asked this question because i saw something i think yesterday you know i've had a lot of time to myself in these last four days it's been a apparently lot of so <laughs> laying down <laughs> Um, and being on my phone. So I've been going through a lot of stuff. Um, Notre Dame was predicted to play Oregon and the Fiesta Bowl, I believe, is where their prediction um, is at right now. So just kind of throwing that out there. You know, take what you want. I know it's, you know, haven't played a game yet, but that's that's the prediction for where people are seeing them kind of fall by the end of the season. So longtime college football writer Pat Forty of Sports Illustrated said on the College Football Inquirer podcast this week, he wonders if Marcus Freeman was too nice in his first season as head coach. I don't think he's completely alone in this. He was obviously a popular assistant coach, popular with the team, and then uh, he got the promotion. Forty asked Freeman when he was in town a couple of weeks ago if he was meaner to his assistants this offseason. Freeman said, well, not meaner, <laughs> but more demanding. So what do you think of all this? I think um, this is just who, like, that's the Marcus Freeman. That's who Marcus Freeman is. Like, that's the perfect kind of response. When things get bad under Marcus Freeman's, I guess, you know, oversight or control, it's not, Marcus Freeman doesn't just start yelling and getting mad at people and blaming other people. It's a lot of self-reflection and then realizing what he needs more out of you know what he needs to demand out of his coaches, demand what he needs out of his players. And so I think it's a, a great response. And I think it's a response that also makes a ton of sense because if you're going to work forward and you're gonna make you know fix mistakes because no one's gonna be perfect, things are gonna go wrong, they're gonna have to fix things on the fly. You need a relationship that is a good relationship, right? And so if you're just yelling and barking at someone. I don't know about you, but when you're someone's yelling and barking at you, there's hesitancy to kind of want to cooperate in a way that is most, you know, most productive, right? And so when there's mutual respect and it's, hey, we need to have a conversation of we're not doing what we need to do right now. We need more out of you. I think that's different than just ripping into someone and getting mad and saying, right. you know, figure this out essentially. So I'd love that response on Marcus Freeman's behalf. You can be a nice guy, but you can also still be demanding when you're out there on the field. Right. And I, and I think that he was. And I think that some people, and I don't know if it was because we got so used to seeing Brian Kelly and some of his stuff on the on the sidelines, like that, that Marcus Freeman was supposed to show all this emotion to be a good head coach. I, I don't think you necessarily need that. But at the same time, because of the relationships that he had, especially with assistants, going from being an assistant coach – who was on the staff to now all of a sudden you've got guys who are essentially your peers you've elevated on the food chain. And all of a sudden 
they're working for you. So I, I think that they're, you know, there's a little bit of a, you know, kind of a push and pull on how you're going to handle that as an assistant, especially as well liked as Marcus Freeman is, and it just, just, just sort of how that dance was going to go. And so it makes sense that sort of after a season to sort of feel that out and, and he found out about himself in a lot of different ways as a head coach last year, whether it was on game day, on Monday, on Tuesday, whatever, with all those relationships, you know, all the stuff working with guys who are now again, working under him as well as the, uh, the players. But now, you know, going into year two, it's like, okay, I've got to expect more. I, I I need more from you in in this facet. I think that he kind of had to learn the buttons that needed to be pushed. And even, you know, we've, we've talked about it. Even out there was some of the emotion that he was showing when he was talking to his team, kind of trying to fire them up before practices this year, when he was getting out there and, you know, kind of getting on them a little bit, trying to motivate them a little bit. So I think that he's, he's figuring out, what buttons that he needed to be pushed. I don't, I don't think you can just, like you said, you just can't come out firing and you're, you know, you're yelling and you're pushing, doing all this stuff all at once, especially when you've shown that that's not necessarily your personality. Right. Got to, got to stay true to, to who he is, I think. So according to multiple reports, Stanford, Cal and SMU are now seriously being considered for membership in the ACC. ACC is expected to get an extra $2.2 million per school annually if they're to add these three teams. And all three of them have um, are, are willing, apparently, to take a, a greatly reduced revenue share in their first few years of the agreement if they are indeed accepted into the ACC with SMU saying we don't need money for the first seven years, which is like shows you how much money SMU <laughs> has. But so Notre Dame has been pushing for this to happen. So if it happens, what benefit do you see in the Irish or what impact do you see on this? For Notre First, Dame? I would just like to say, I proposed this idea about two weeks ago and it's kind of coming, coming to fruition. So Mark one down in the win category, first of all. But <laughs> second of all, you know, I don't I don't see this as something that's like a clear cut paste or cut and dry. You know, Notre Dame helps them and Notre Dame gets X out of it as a reward. Right. I think this is similar to kind of like Notre Dame and Navy. Right. Like the reason why that this um, rivalry or series of games have gone on so long is because with Notre Dame or with Navy. Okay, I see. What you're yeah, saying. Notre Dame, you know, helped Navy, and Navy in turn helped Notre Dame, and that's kind of been, you know, they just kind of had each other's backs going forward, right? And I think that's a similar situation with Stanford and Cal. I don't think Notre Dame really expects anything out of this. Jack Schwarberg has just been on the record saying, you know, we can't leave some of these ac academically prestigious institutions left out of this just because, you know, they're not as appealing to these big media markets and, and the money that's being drawn from these. So I just think it's kind of like brothers having each other's backs um, ultimately. And, you know, sure, I think it helps Notre Dame down the road potentially if, if, if things fall out with NBC and they have to join a conference, right? And, and it looks really good to the ACC um, that you know they've Notre Dame's helped them in the past. They've allowed their Olympic sports to participate in the ACC, etc. So again, I don't see it being some sort of like big reward that Notre Dame's getting out of this. I just think it's a lot of respect and a lot again, kind of like a brotherhood of you know we have your back. And then hopefully Notre Dame would say you know maybe twenty years down the road for whatever reason if Notre Dame found itself in a hole that these kind of these kind of institutions would help them you know get out of the hole. I, I think that's more of what I'm looking at here. Cal and Stanford, and Stanford specifically, since that's who Notre Dame has been playing every year for a couple of decades now, there are other academic schools, and, and Notre Dame is kind of going to bat trying to help out these academic schools. And I'm not saying that this is what I'm about to say is the reason that Notre Dame is pushing for this, but I kind of started thinking about, okay, what happens if Stanford specifically gets into the ACC? Well, you're not going to be playing Stanford every year anymore. 
that's that's going to go away. You're still going to be playing Stanford on a rotation because they're just going to become part of the ACC rotation, just like Notre Dame used to have fairly regular series with both Boston College and Pittsburgh. Once those teams, once those schools joined the ACC, they weren't playing them every year again. They play them as part of the ACC rotation, and that will happen with Stanford as well. So if you're like me, and I know Vince is in this boat as well, and you're not necessarily that thrilled about seeing Stanford every year, then if Stanford is in the ACC, they're just going to become part of the ACC rotation. So you'll still play Stanford every few years, but you're not going to be playing them all the time. And like I said, it opens up it opens up other opportunities. Like I have said, replace Stanford with UCLA, for example, in that in that every year rotation. So now every year, if you've got USC and <coughs> UCLA, every year you're going to Southern California, Los Angeles, and every year you've got one of those two schools coming here. Now, will that happen? I don't know. But if Stanford is in the ACC, that ends the annual series between those two teams. Now, that obviously means you're going to pick up Cal – You're going to pick up SMU. But for Notre Dame, it also means that there are other sports. They're going to be doing more traveling by going to the West Coast to play Cal and Stanford. But uh, there are other sports are going to kind of get to make more appearances out there on the West Coast, which is still a good recruiting hotbed. So I think that there are definitely some benefits for Notre Dame and some different impacts for Notre Dame if all this actually does come to pass. Yeah. And I, I do agree with you. I think there's like, there's like, there's a bunch of kind of little rewards, you know, spread out here, there, everywhere. But I get, I, I guess the main point I was trying to make is there's not just one big overarching, you know, this is what Notre Dame gets out of it type situation at, at the end of the day. Yeah. I, this comment from uh, Trader Z, the North Carolina, that's actually the women's soccer coach said that, uh, He didn't want Cal and Stanford. The ACC wanted him to die in the vine so they don't recruit against him. Yeah, and I mean. Come on, that's that's just being lazy. Let's be honest. None of this this is driven by what's going on with the soccer program or the baseball (laughs) programs or the softball or anything else. This is driven by football. So he's going to have to live with it just like everybody else. He's got a few national championships out there, but. Just be honest. Nobody cares what the soccer coaches think in all this. It's just, it's just a fact. It's just the way it is. Yep. Jesse, besides quarterback, what position will make the most improvement for Notre Dame this season? Um, so <laughs> I think this question goes hand in hand with how you think the season's going to with the outcome of the season um, and what's going to happen with the offense and Sam Hartman. I think if Sam Hartman is going to have a big year and they're going to throw for a lot of yards and, and have a lot of touchdowns, well, what's that mean? Wide receivers got to step up, catch the ball um, and for, you know, whatever it is, touchdowns, uh, short yardage, big plays, whatever it might be. So I think that uh, to answer this question, it's 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 most definitely 100% the wide receiver room. How did I know you were going that direction? I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's, I mean, it, it makes sense because they do go hand in hand. I'll just say the defensive line, though, because I think the defensive line was – Good last year. It was it 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 was solid. Anyway. It was average and got the job done, but it didn't go over the top in any way. Exactly. And I think that this year's defensive line has a really good chance to go over the top and just be great. It it, it has a chance to be pr- maybe the best defensive line we've seen in the last ten or eleven years <laughs> at Notre Dame. And you know, they've obviously sent some guys to the NFL from that defensive line. And so I just really high on it. On the defensive line, I think it is going to be vastly improved this season. I think you're right. The receiving the receiving room is also going to look a lot better this year because they've got that quarterback to get them the football. So those those would be like defensive line would be my one. Receivers would be my number two. Fill in the blank. You would fill blank if Notre Dame does not cover its current 20 and a half point spread against Navy Saturday. Um, I wouldn't feel, ah, man, I wouldn't feel like too horrible about it. Right. Cause like I I've been looking at, 
you know, first of all, Notre Dame and spreads, not a fun game to play. Um, <laughs> not after, not last year. It wasn't not a fun game to play at all, but I started to look at the history. I like to go in 20 year samples. So we'll go back to 2003. Um, I'm counting right now. One, uh, two, or sorry, one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, uh, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Out of 20 matchups in the last 20 years, Notre Dame has covered that spread only eight well, times. Eight times. Eight wow. times. So if we're going by, you know, Notre Dame's history of really not being a good spread team and then looking at Notre Dame versus Navy in the last 20 years and they've only covered that spread – eight times, you know, I wouldn't be too worried about it. Um, but it is the first game of the year. And when Notre Dame beats Navy, they thump Navy, right? Like it's usually either relatively kind of close um, or it's, it's just a good old thumping. I think mm-hmm. it's going to be a good old thumping this year. Um, I, again, I wouldn't feel some type of way if they don't cover that spread, because I think the backups are eventually going to get in and then, you know, triple option offense against backups is never really fun because it's right. a lot of assignment sound football. And who wants to play against a triple option team when you're trying yep. to wrap up a game? You know Sets what I mean? Self up for some backdoor covers for sure. Right. And so I, I again, I Notre Dame could go up 24 um, and then, you know, maybe sneak in a, a last second touchdown. Right. So I don't I don't feel bad about it. I wouldn't feel bad about it, but I still think Notre Dame's going to thump them this year. Yeah. Stymie, this is this is the point here. That, that great point that he's making. Are we talking barely not covering or barely getting the win? That's a great differentiator. Yeah. And that's right exactly, there. that's the best way to put this. If they win by three again this year, then yeah, there's concern. But if they win by 19 and they sneak in a last couple touchdowns while the backups are in, I don't right. feel, I don't feel uh, right. bad about that. That's why you don't touch that line. You don't touch the <laughs> spread. Don't mess with the spread. That's right. You can go point total, but don't touch the spread on this. Let's find out a little bit about this team <laughs> first after after their history of, of not being able to cover last year. That's exactly right. Fill in the blank. Notre Dame's season over under win total remains eight and a half. It'll be blank if they don't go over on that. It'll be stage two meltdown if they don't go over eight and a half wins this year because Under that means nine wins. Are you kidding me? That oh. means you're at least eight and four again this year. And what I said, you asked me a little bit ago, you know, what I deem a successful season, um, staying stagnant and show it, not showing growth. That's not a successful season. Um, I'm just going to point out point blank. Say I'm putting a lot on that over eight and a half win total this year. And I'm thinking about even bumping it up to nine and a half. Uh, and, and being at the 10, 10 win mark this season. So Uh-oh. I am, I am, I am very confident that this team is a nine win team at minimum. And I think everyone else should too. I don't, I don't see them having another eight and four uh, season. And it would be very disappointing if that was the case. It would be disappointment of disappointments to have back to back at best eight and four seasons in the first two years of a new head coach after all that uh, this program has done the previous five years and you, then you you add a quarterback like Sam Hartman all these different things you go eight and four again that means that that not only are you and you know then we have to start talking about who are the wins against who are the losses against you because know, are you <laughs> yeah. gonna be like last year where you where you beat a Clemson and maybe even knock off Ohio State and or USC but then you're losing games that you're not supposed to lose you know that's that's where that's where it gets even dicier. Who are you? And then the conversations start changing really quickly. So it would be it would be stage five depth con. <laughs> we're having some serious conversations here if if we're talking about not even winning nine games again. Yeah, Jason says he'd put it on the over if it's eight and a half, and that's I mean I'm doing that, baby. It just seems too easy, but there are still people like I was watching. A gambling show last week, and they're talking about under on Notre Dame, and it's just I don't know, like what the I I don't know. I, I realize, okay, you know, you you've lost this production, and I I 
I don't know what else Vegas is putting all this on right now because if I think the only thing that would make sense because I think their defense is going to be fine. I think they're going to have a great defense, a ton of experience, ton of depth. I think that their offensive line will be great. I think Sam Hartman will be great. I think the only thing that could potentially hold them back is what is a new first-year offensive coordinator going to look like? If that completely falls on its face, then that could be obviously very detrimental to this team. But I don't foresee that, but I would see that as being kind of the big thing that I think others are looking at is can this offense really come together with all of the new pieces um, and, and be you know a, a prolific and high-scoring um, like we think they're going to be? So, Jess, final one for you tonight. The Little League World Series has dominated ESPN for the last week or so. Scale of 1 to 10, how into it are you? Um, I'm not going to lie. This is like a 0 out of 10. I haven't watched one minute. I haven't watched one second. Um, it's just, <laughs> it's a great experience for those kids. And I loved, you know, when I was a kid playing on all-star teams, trying to make it all the way down to the Little League World Series. Um, but outside of that and the families that are, you know, participating, I, there's just, there's just not, not a lot of interest. It's not good baseball. There's not good umpires. Like, and I say it's not good baseball because it's not, it's just not, you know, professional or college baseball, right? Like you see kids making airs and like, I know they're giving their best effort and, you know, competition and they're good for their age and et cetera, et cetera. But it's just like, it's still not super enjoyable to watch. So I, I just always found it. We, you know, it's like, okay, little league, and it's just, it's just a. When you think about the fact that they are televising and they put all this money into these games, they're they're televising all these games. It is a random age group in a random league, basically, that they have decided to highly publicize and put on TV, basically, so that we can watch what ESPN tells us we should be watching. There are a lot of other age groups and, you know, leagues and baseball, you know, out there that are, as you said, that are, that are actually better baseball than what you're seeing out there. And I'm not trying to like slam on the little league or whatever. I'm just not into it. And it, it, like, personally, there's been no PTI for the last couple of weeks because <laughs> of the fact that all these games are on. And then I go to my Kornheiser DVR and tonight. Wilbon must love that world yeah, series I, week. It's vacation week for them. Yeah, I go to my DVR and it says that PTI is supposed to be on. So guess what happens? I flip it over there and guess what's on? A Little League World Series game is still <laughs> on when it says PTI is supposed to be on. So I'm sorry. I, you know, and I know it's great, great for the kids, great experience. That's what I mean. Like, I, I understand that. I'm not, I'm not that like trying to knock it. I'm just not into it at all. <laughs> Derek brought up a. A good point here. Uh, I Me being sick this week sucked because the Dodgers were in town. And you know me, like I, I like to go see games like that because I get to see Freddie Freeman, like Mookie Betts, uh -huh. stuff like that. So I, I was sad that I missed out, but I had a buddy. So Kershaw was supposed to pitch. What's today? Thursday? Yeah. Kershaw was supposed to pitch Tuesday, the season opener. They moved him to Wednesday. Wednesday's game yesterday got rained out after three innings. So Kershaw's start not only got moved, but then it gets washed out by the rain. And so Cleveland fans only got to see like two or three innings of Kershaw pitching, get dumped on with rain. And that's about it. So it's been, it's been a, uh, it's been a, a rainy, messy series against the Dodgers. I'm kind of glad I was a little sick because I think it'd have been frustrating trying to manage these different games this week. Is is it as hot and muggy in Cleveland right now the last couple of days as it's been um, here in South Bend? You know, Bend? to be honest with you, I have not been outside no, all that much. Probably but when lucky. I've been outside, it's hard for me to say because I'm our, I, like I've had the 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 fever, the fever sweats, right? And so like everything has felt <laughs> hot to me. I'm just yeah. walking around sweating everywhere. I got up this morning and all the windows on the house were steamed outside Ooh, that's how you know it's hot because the air is mixing from the coldness on the inside and the, uh -huh. the hotness on the outside yep that's right all right well that's going to do it for today and this week we do have again don't forget we've got the countdown to kickoff show coming up the uh, youtube video will be up friday night and the podcast the audio podcast will drop saturday morning both uh, the uh, the main portion of the show as well as the uh, rapid fire portion of the show. So we've got that coming up for our pregame show. And of course, there'll be a live postgame show 
after Notre Dame Navy as well. <laughs> Tommy guns. <laughs> <laughs> he said that there's some mailbag question in here that you didn't, didn't get to, but. Well, get, show, throw the question up there again. See, see, that's like he apparently he like <laughs> slips stuff in early and I don't see it. And then he gets mad. So I didn't see a question. You have 30 earlier. seconds before we shut this down. That's right. Get your question in. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I found it. It says, Sean, can you please explain to Jesse that Swarbrick, how I've been saying it, and Schwarber are pronounced the same on the front end? <laughs> yes. Swarbrick. There's no there's no eight or there's no CH in Swarbrick. Schwarber Swarbrick. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Found Thank it. you very much. Thank you very much, Tommy, for pointing that out. Maybe Jack Swarbrick will appreciate that as well. <laughs> also, uh, for a lot of people who have questions about constantly about Notre Dame's, you know, media and, and, and whether they join a conference or not, there's a really good interview with Dan Patrick um, and Jack out there. So if, and he answers a lot of those questions that I think people have, you know, have had kind of lingering and it's good to hear it straight from the mouth. So. I only bored, saw, that's a good interview to kind of throw on. I saw part of it. I actually went to the to the podcast today and I, I saved that. He's got Dan Patrick show does like a best of where they put their interviews. So it's got Swarbrick <laughs> and I can't remember if it's got Quinn or Freeman. It's got one of the two and then there, there were a couple others. So Freeman was on there, I think, today. Brady Quinn was on yesterday. A lot of uh, Leonard Notre Dame stuff out there and with uh, with Dan Patrick in Dublin this week. Pretty cool. Good life. Yeah. Good one to live. All right. Hit the like button on your way out. Subscribe, rate, and review. And we will talk to you on the countdown show on IBN.